Lama is the uh, the National Assets Management Agency. I'm not an economist. I don't know too much about it. But basically, they're taking all the bad debts from uh, developers and banks across the country and, and trying to work through that. So it's kind of a watershed period within within Ireland. Um, and the Ireland After NAM site basically is, um, I suppose, it's our attempt as a bunch of academics here to look at the sort of the depths of the recession and what's happening across the country. Look at things like unemployment, the housing, things like that. Uh, there's a wide variety of subjects that we look at on the site, but it's mainly to do with planning. Um, Thank you. Essentially, the kind of impetus for that as well have been. We felt like there was a kind of prevalence of an economics type of discourse that was dealing with the recession or dealing with the crisis, and you know, as a group of sort of social scientists, I think we wanted to try to you know create some sort of space in which social scientists could make a kind of public contribution or public commentary, you know, that would be a sort of counteraction to this sort of macroeconomic discourse. Um, so, okay, thanks. Um, this kind of I'm going to follow on a little bit from what Justin was talking about. You know, he kind of gave you a good introduction or overview of what the sort of issue of the ghost estates and how that emerged. Um, and clearly, ghost estates are kind of encapsulated in like social, political, and sort of um, physical problems. You know, um, you know, which will kind of need to be dealt with. I think over the next kind of number of years, and kind of control a number of sort of important issues. But I'm kind of going to move off that point slightly a bit in this presentation as well, and sort of look. Um, really, uh, how the ghost estate functions as a representational space in a Lefebvrean sense. Um, so, basically, you look at how the ghost estate has been evoked as a symbolic and discursive vehicles in reframing the narrative of the Celtic Tiger and the crash. Um, so, the, in this sense, then, and in line with you know, what we're kind of doing today in terms of spectral traces through the theme as well, I look at sort of how ghost estates and function as a space uh, that, that essentially provides a pivot between past, present, and future in Ireland, where it's been sort of evoked and seen as this. Um, the ghost estate as a term in itself, you know, I should explain, like it's a particular subset of unfinished estates, but one that's become sort of seen as a central um, sort of discursive vehicle essentially, you know, to look at the crash. So in some ways it, it's more of a discursive term than a material term, although particularly there are particular ghost estates, but ghost estates form part of a bigger problem which is unfinished estates and that's partially vacancy and ghost estates are a particular kind of subset that sort of become a kind of um, a kind of key term in sort of the reimagining of Celtic Tiger Ireland in the post crash space. Um, so this this paper then is essentially kind of attempt to think, begin thinking through how um, how that I feel significant ways the ghost state functions as important space in post Celtic Tiger Ireland um, that folds together these past, presents, and futures. Uh, so in this talk, then I'm going to look at kind of three broadly interrelated themes, or look at ghost state under that, and that's sort of look first as a sort of iconic national landscape, as a ruin, and an interesting form of ruin, and as a spectral place. <coughs> okay. Okay. So the inevitable collapse of the Irish property market in late 2008 has left its mark in the form of empty houses, abandoned retail parks, and half-built estates. The ghosts of the Celtic Tiger are visible everywhere across the country, and the fragments of development now stand as unfinished or unoccupied shelves of what they are planned to be. The ghost estates, a smaller subset of unfinished estates, are a particularly austere example of the spectacular collapse of the Celtic Tiger, a metaphor for the glut of excess, characteristic of the year, and impending social dissolution. The remnants of construction sites stand frozen in time, often with cranes, diggers, cabins, and other artifacts left undisturbed behind steel frames, cording off from occupied dwellings in the circular. Perhaps the circus examples in rural areas where small populations have seen overdevelopment have left um, lush natural landscapes irrevocably transformed. Uh, ghost estates have become symbolic spaces in a national narrative capturing the transition from boom to bust, unprecedented growth to almost unfathomable collapse. Prosperity to negative equity. Um, this isn't due in large part due to the reciprocal relationship between property and banking. Um, Irish banks are shown to be seriously undercapitalized and collapsed. Um, and this resulted then in millions of taxpayers' money being pumped into bailouts and setting up for as Justin was just talking about. In articulating these trends, then the ghost estate has become an important iconic space that reflect both the aspirations and excesses of the Celtic Tiger period and the catastrophic fallout of the collapse. So they offered then a highly visible, symbolic, and physical articulation of these trends. Um, 
While the banking crisis provided stark evidence, um, it remained somewhat abstract, stark evidence of the crash. It visualized through stacks of figures that are in many ways too obscenely large to even be comprehended. In contrast, then, the ghost estate provided a simple and resting metaphor. Rows and rows of empty houses, new houses, half-built houses, estates left unfinished, plans come undone, dreams never to be realized. Um, however, this outcome was in no way then um, similar to that process, but it was formed and it's got a reciprocal relationship with the banking crisis. Um, the term ghost estate goes back to 2006 when um, David McWilliams, an economist, uh, started using it. And he suggested all over Ireland ghost estates are enveloping many of our towns. Driving back from the west, these spooky ghost estates emerged out of the mist, announcing places like Terry Manbury, French Bar, and Edwardstown. Anywhere there is a tax driven scene, there is a ghost estate. You don't have to be a child or believe in Halloween to find the scary. Um, now, despite this kind of term emerging during this period, it only really started to get a kind of mainstream media usage in about 2009, I think. You know? um, so I think you know, the, the discrepancy between you know, when the term was first introduced and its widespread usage um, shows the kind of disconnection between supply and demand in the market. Um, in fact, after this period, after 2006, housing output rose marginally before kind of falling again. Um, so empty houses then meant nothing without the realisation that the property sector had crashed. <coughs> um, so then, these estates then essentially went from being half-built in the sense that they were not yet completed, to being half-built in the sense that they would never be completed. Um, part of this obviously is the sort of the visualisation of these places, you know, which obviously nurse I think you know, plays a sort of part in you know, stimulating this sort of image within the media discourse as well. Um, this is a quote from the Department uh, of the Environment Sustainable Communities document, um, and while you know this is very clearly you know a disarticulation of what's kind of present in the picture, and while the sustainable communities rhetoric always bore little relationship to the entrepreneurial event of development, um, the, the debris of the property crisis of the crash, as it was sort of um, as it emerged, uh, showed just how an atom it really was to it. Um, arguably, the establishment of NAMA then was the sort of turning point in this, which became the realization then that the property sector had crashed. Um, essentially, during the Celtic Tiger period, the building site or construction site had become part of the national landscape aesthetic. That was a comfortable symbol of progress on the periphery of our vision. Essentially, it became a very normalized site to see a constant stream of development. The people became essentially desensitized to what this meant in terms of changing space. Um, the combined realisation that the banks and property had crashed created, in a sense, a developmental silence um, that, within the kind of acknowledgement of this crash, you know, created sort of almost an archaeological cross-section through which we could see the process and factors that brought us to this point. Um, so Atlanta Boyne suggests that in times of transition, um, nations often, often look for symbolic spaces in which um, you can kind of visualize uh, new types of narratives emerging and find a sort of substitute to the narratives that have died. Um, and in the sense of the transition from the Celtic Tiger period then to the post-Celtic Tiger, ghost estates kind of function within this, within this place. They form these kind of symbolic or monumental landscapes through which to visualize the past, present, and future. Um, and this has often been so much so in the case that uh, they become, in a sense, simplified in their iconic image. Um, I, as one of these kind of you know media blogs with Nurse after the ghost estate map, I did um, I went out with some French journalists to estates in Dublin, you know, and they complained that they weren't ghostly enough. They had a particular image in mind of what a ghost estate was, and you know, rather than trying to see the complexities of this, they wanted to find that image in film. Okay. Um, so then, if ghost estates are part of a sort of post boom metaphoric and material Irish landscape, how can we kind of conceptualise them? Um, the first way I kind of want to look at this is through looking at the ghost estate as a site of ruin, um, and a very kind of interesting site of ruin, I would think. Um, this is a this is a photo from um, it's zcode.com. It's a photography blog. I think. Um, these are apartment blocks in Sligo, which were built um, maybe 2007 or 2008. 
Um, and they're completely empty, but they've been, you know, as you can see, there's a series of photographs up there, and I advise you to check out the site. Um, you can see that there's been a, a range of sort of vandalism going on, you know, and, and these places have basically been deconstructed, you know. Um, but in terms of looking at ruins, uh, Walter Benjamin suggests ruins expose the light of internal progress through modernity, and he suggests the key to unlocking the secrets of modernity can be found in obsolescence. Um, ruins and dereliction then are usually viewed as signs of urban blight or signs of dysfunctional cities. Um, they connect urban space to a past in a way that halts or disrupts modernity's eternal progress. So if we're talking about kind of disrupted kind of our um, disrupting this kind of idea of linear time, you know, ruins kind of function in this because there's sort of an interruption in this idea of progress, you know. Um, so as, as Tim Eden sort of suggests here, um, he suggests that in a conventional reading of urban landscapes, dereliction and ruin is a sign of waste and local politicians and entrepreneurs, uh, for local politicians and entrepreneurs, it tends to provide stock evidence of an area's lack that simultaneously signifies a vanished prosperity and by contrast an uncertain future. However, ruins are also um, always pro uh, projected a future. And the ghost say clearly encapsulates this function then in terms of what Walter Benjamin would call a dialectical image, and that there are spaces in which the past, Celtic Tiger prosperity, speculation, young mad, present unemployment, negative equity, and dilapidation of future, the uncertainty of um, what will come next, kind of come into collision. Um, However, while even sir suggests that urban ruins are generally associated with declining industrial areas, ghost estates are simultaneously both new and derelict. So they kind of throw up an unusual sort of characterization of ruin, um, which kind of foregoes this sort of idea of sort of um, a past or sort of inhabited place like that, or a gothic kind of sensibility to looking at these kind of spaces physically. Um, but nevertheless, kind of throw up sort of interesting notions or interesting issues around that. Um, so they're both a symptom then of the speeding up of capitalism's creative destruction, but also indicative perhaps of more psychological geographies that attempt to deal with the fallout of the crash. Um, so in a sense, drawing on, on Karen Till's work here, these, these spaces are kind of, can be seen as sort of wounded spaces, not uh, clearly in the sense of you know, the levels of, sort of trauma um, that Karen deals with in some of her work, but nevertheless sort of spaces in which um, these kind of like ideas or issues come to the fore. I'm running a bit blind here, so I'm going to flick through a bit. Um, Okay, so I'll just go very quickly through this sort of last um, aspect. So, um, so the ghost estate also then can be seen as a sort of spectral place, um, which is also recognition that place does not exist in linear time, multiple temporalities, how we experience sort of memory, and how we experience place through sort of um, this sort of disjuncture or out of joint time. Um, so this then is not just a passive, obsolete frame of reference, but the interplay of memory and everyday life actively constructs place in the present. Um, Post-Celtic Tiger Island is a society grappling with the fallout of intense collapse, not only in the economy, but in but the series of narratives and identities that underpin the whole era. This is reflected in the everyday lives of citizens, many of whom lost their jobs or in precarious economic situations, struggling with heavy mortgages, angry at the opportunities afforded to them if they lost for their children. Melancholia pervades the country as emigration has again risen, and the long-term financial and governance impacts of the IMF bailout are beginning to sink in. Um, as space is at the forefront of this national reimagining, most states are susceptible to emotional upheaval, perhaps more than most. They suggest ruptures between present and past. Thus, residents in these estates will need to reconcile themselves with the uh, prospect of living with few neighbours in places that remain unfinished and stand in stark contrast to the billboards that still advertise the lifestyles they promised them in homes that continue to steeply lose their value. They need to commute to their workplaces, raise their children, go to their schools, play with their friends, socialize and organize within and through these places. And, oh my gosh, 30 seconds more? <laughs> 15. 15. <laughs> Ghost of States are spaces with complex material and material contributions, new and derelict, homeplace and uncanny, um, and signifying various manifestations of presence and absence. They've been significant in terms of how they've been drawn upon and understood as uh, symbolic spaces that encapsulate the crash of the Celtic Tiger period of economic growth. More of the ghost estates are key spaces within the emerging economic geography of Ireland in its relationship to banking debt, unemployment, and the crisis in public finances. 
These states will undoubtedly be at the forefront of a recalibration of the nation post-crash. In this sense, now I will play a key role in deciding the futures of these places. However, more than being interesting laboratories in which social and economic geographies will emerge, they are first and foremost ordinary places of everyday life. They are iconic places and problematic places, but also places in which residents will need to live their lives, raise families, form communities, and address the physical and emotional deficits encapsulated in these states. Ultimately, the hope of buildings will be better from these incomplete spaces. Thank you.